In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. I'd like to uh, apologize. We had some technical difficulties. The uh, updating came on right at the moment in which I was about to start my program, so I apologize for being a little bit late this morning. But let's uh, start uh, right now. So um, let's start, of course, by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary has many beautiful titles among which Mary is the mother of God, Mary is the mother of the church, and Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. We cry out to Mary also in the Hail Holy Queen as Mary is our, she's our life, our sweetness, and our hope among the many beautiful titles that we give to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And of course the prayer that she loves most is the Hail Mary. So let's uh, start off our new week by placing ourselves in the hands and the heart of Mary, ask Mary to watch over us and to guide us. As we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now we'd like to do is we'd like to invite our spiritual director to come to be with us. And our spiritual director, of course, is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit is very much present with us in these days in which we're preparing for the coming we're preparing for the coming of the Holy Spirit by making our novena. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to be with us because the Holy Spirit is our, he's the paraclete. The Holy Spirit is the gift of God. The Holy Spirit is the mutual bond of love between the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is the sweet gift of, gift, uh, guest of our soul. And as St. Paul says, the Holy Spirit is also our interior master. We don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so we can say, Abba. Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So, let's ask the Sanctifier to make us holy, and let's ask the Holy Spirit to guide us into the way of peace, into the way of holiness. And let's pray the prayer to the Holy Spirit, the classical prayer of the Holy Spirit. That is, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael, Pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Nasha Loyola, pray for us. St. Faustina, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. 
So I apologize for the technical problems we had the first eight minutes because uh, the computer decided to update right when I was about to start my, pro my program. So uh, thank you for your patience. And um, so let's, uh, let's start off. I'd like to, once again, to pray for you and your intentions. I like to always start off with that because we all, we all need prayers. So today I will pray for you. I actually have two Masses today. So on this beautiful Sunday of the Ascension of our Lord in Los Angeles, in these two Masses, I will offer special intentions for all of you. I'd like to place all of you on the altar and beg the Lord to send from heaven many special graces. And I'd like to offer um, for you and your loved ones three intentions. The first is, uh, given that we celebrate the Ascension today, The Ascension today, I would like to pray in a special way that all of you will go to heaven. So really there's nothing more important in our lives than to arrive at our final destiny, which is heaven. And the feast day of Jesus ascending into heaven is a feast day in which we reflect upon the reality of heaven. So I'd like to pray that you and your loved ones will all go to heaven. That's why we're here. St. Ignatius teaches us that we are here to praise God, to reverence God, to serve God, and by means of that, to save our souls. My second intention would be I'd like to pray for your children, your teenagers, some of you had grand, uh, grandchildren, I'd like to pray for the young people. Because of today and the paganistic society in which we live in, and we can't deny it, the world seems to be militating against all of us, but especially our children and our teenagers. For that reason, yesterday started a consecration program to Mary through the children of Fatima, so that these children would pray for our children and pray for our teenagers. So that will be my second intention. Third intention would be related to the novena that we've entered into. We have entered into, a couple of days ago, a very important novena. Novena means nine. Novena means nine. Nine consecutive days in which we want to be praying in a special way. Praying in a special way for the coming of the Holy Spirit. 2,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost will be next Sunday. So we're going to be begging for the coming of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's true the Holy Spirit came in our lives on the day of our baptism. Then the day of our confirmation, the Holy Spirit was fortified in our lives. But constantly we have to be fanning the flame, like using bellows to fan the flame. Constantly we have to keep fanning the flame so that the Holy Spirit will not become dormant or stagnant or suppressed in our lives. We have to keep fanning that flame fanning that flame, the Holy Spirit will be very operative in our lives. So, what I'm going to do right now, I'm just going to give you a very brief summary of where we are liturgically. I'd like to mention, speak about one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, then we'll talk about 
the ascension, what we celebrate today, what is this? What is the ascension of our Lord into heaven? What does it really mean? What does the Bible teach about it? And how does it speak to us? How does it affect us? The ascension of our Lord into heaven. Okay. Liturgically, we, we connect with Jesus Christ in many ways. Jesus said he he would go up to heaven, but that he would not leave us orphans. So if Jesus is going up to heaven, what we actually celebrate today, his ascension on high to heaven. Well, how is it that he said, I will be with you always until the end of the world, if then he leaves us and he passes through the clouds and he enters into heaven he sits at the right hand of God the Father well in this way maybe remember when Saint Stephen was being stoned to death we read that early in the Acts of the Apostles Stephen looked up to heaven and he saw Jesus actually there in heaven standing at the right hand of God the Father so Jesus is pre was present for those 33 years on life 33 years in his uh, private and public life about 2,000 uh, years ago. But also, Jesus is present in his church. And he's the head of the church and we, we are the members of the church. And this is called, in the words of St. Paul, developed by the popes like Pope Pius XII, it's called the mystical body of Christ. True, he's present in heaven in his glorified state. But he's present in, in the church, the mystical body of Christ, which is us. So, we are in, just that we, we can connect with Christ in his mystical body, the church. We are in, the tail end of a very important liturgical season. This is the Easter season. The Easter season was preceded by Lent, the 40 days in which we went with our Lord into the desert, praying, fasting, and trying to arrive at a deeper conversion of our lives. And Lent culminates in Holy Week. Holy Week, you have the Easter Triduum, which is Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday. And it culminates in so the solemnity of all the solemnities. And that solemnity is Easter Sunday, in which Easter Sunday we celebrate the glorious resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus rose from the dead, never to die again. So that we celebrated as the culmination of the Lenten season, Holy Week, Easter Triduum, and we celebrate Easter. Now, Easter Sunday, we cannot celebrate such a glorious event in the life of Christ in our lives. We cannot exhaust the riches of that day in one day. Therefore, the church celebrates the Easter day for eight days. This is actually called the octave of Easter. So from Easter day, which is celebrated the night before, it's called the Easter Vigil Mass, beautiful Mass. It extends the whole eight days until we celebrate what is Divine Mercy Sunday. So Divine Mercy Sunday we celebrate the Sunday after Easter. Beautiful picture, isn't it? Jesus, I trust in you. So those eight days are eight days of great celebration. 
culminating in Divine Mercy Sunday, which we're able to receive the promise of a total forgiveness and remission of our sins if we were able to go to confession and communion on that day, confession during Lent. Okay, so let's move on to understand the whole context of the liturgical cycle that that we're, we're involved in. And it's the following. Easter season lasts 50 days, not the Easter day, eight days. But the Easter season lasts 50 days. Lent, 40 days. Easter season, 50 days. And the Lent does not even count the su the Sunday. So this, putting both these seasons together, both Lent and Easter, it's about 100 days. So that's a good block of time. It's, you know, it's uh, about in between a third and a quarter of the whole church year is Lent as well as Easter. Now, 40, 40 days after the resurrection of Jesus, we celebrate what we're celebrating today, the ascension of Jesus. Now, during this whole these whole 40 days and 50 days, which will be Pentecost next Sunday, we have been reading through the Acts of the Apostles, where we see the action of the Holy Spirit in the early Christian church. We saw the person of St. Peter, and then we saw the person of St. Paul. And Jesus, in those 40 days, he's active. Jesus is appearing to the apostles and the disciples. He first appears to his blessed mother. Even though this is not biblical, we believe he first appeared to the one he loved most. The one that really never doubted. He appears to Mary most holy. Then Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Jesus appears to the apostles. Then he appears to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Then he appears to the apostles in the upper room that same night. Then he appears the apostles when they're fishing. Then he appears to 500 people at the same time. He'll appeal, he appear to St. Paul in a different way on the road to Damascus. So Jesus is constantly appearing to them and they think that Jesus is a ghost at times. So he tells them to stop doubting and he gives proof that he's not a ghost by eating fish in their presence. So during these 40 days, Jesus is appearing to the apostles, trying to fortify their faith, their belief that he is no longer dead, but he's risen from the dead. And he shows them his wounds. Probably remember that Thomas was doubting, Thomas the doubter. Jesus told Thomas to draw close and to put his hands in his wounds and in his side. And not to doubt, but to, but to believe. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Jesus says to Thomas and to us, blessed are those who believe without seeing. So, during these 40 days, Jesus appears to fortify their faith. St. Ignatius of Loyola says, on the, we should be begging for most intense joy during these days. And the joy that we experience is not in material things, but our joy comes as a result of our union with Christ and the belief that Jesus is with us. 
He loves us. He's walking with us. He's our friend. He's our companion. He's our guide. He's our way, the truth, and the life. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He gives meaning to our existence. Yes, that is the reason for our joy and the fact that Jesus is going to give us another gift. The gift that Jesus will give us is the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we arrive at we arrive at what we're celebrating today and next week we'll be celebrating Pentecost. And Pentecost, of course, is the coming of the Holy Spirit. And it's actually the birthday of the church. The coming of the Holy Spirit and the birthday of the church. So, uh, in most dioceses in the United States, we celebrate the ascension of our Lord into heaven today. However, there are a few dioceses that celebrated the ascension of our Lord into heaven last Thursday. Last Thursday, and that would be 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead. So, that's where we're at. So for us to connect with Christ, to plug in the graces that Christ wants to give us, Jesus indeed is in heaven, in his glorified state. But he said, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the world. How is he with us now? He's with us now, as we said earlier, in the mystical body. It's called the mystical body of Christ. He is the head and we are the members. We are the, as St. Peter says, we are the precious stones in the mystical body of Christ. All of you, all of us have great importance. Your soul is worth more than the whole created universe. My soul is worth more than the whole created universe. So, how do, we, how do we plug in? How do we plug into this current of grace, this union with Christ, who said, I am the vine and you're the branches. My Father will cut the branches that are not producing fruit. I've come that you have life and life in abundance. By this is my Father glorified by your bearing much fruit. So we connect like a plug in a, in a socket. We, we, we connect with this electric current of grace through the church and through the sacraments. So every time that you, every time that you go to Mass, and you participate in Mass. As Vatican II says, participating fully, actively, consciously in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, which is the renewal of, the, of Calvary in an invisible fashion. Every time you do that, you're connecting with Christ. In the most sublime moment, the culminating moment of grace is when you receive Holy Communion. When you receive Holy Communion, that should be the most important moment of your week. You receive into your soul the body, the blood, the soul, the divinity of Jesus Christ. You received the total Christ within you. You receive Christ as a child, as a teenager, as a man of 30. You receive also the resurrection of Christ, resurrected Christ who ascends and he sits at the right hand of God the Father. So, if possible today, all of you try to make an effort to go to Mass, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, and if you're in the state of grace, we hope that you are, then approach the Eucharist with great love and reverence. Have your hands folded. Make a reverential bow. Receive the Eucharist. 
into the very depths of your soul. That's the way in which we can really be celebrating the ascension of Jesus into heaven. By us allowing Christ to ascend in our hearts through the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So let's talk now about the um, the the biblical. Let's talk about the, the the biblical reality of the ascension and its meaning for us. The biblical reality of the ascension and its meaning for us. By the way, the ascension. I'm I'm sure you know this. The ascension of Jesus is the. See if I have it here. The ascension of Jesus is actually the it is the second glorious mystery that we meditate upon in the Bible, the Word of God. The ascension of our Lord into heaven. Here we have it. I've got a nice picture of it. Here we have an ascension, the ascension of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ into heaven. Jesus is ascending. Here's a nice picture I have from my rosary pictures. So, my friends, let's uh, let's see if we can go to the the Bible and see what does the Bible, what does the Word of God tell us about the ascension of Jesus? Now there are. There are various passages in the Bible. You'll be listening to the biblical passages in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. But um, these would be the essential ones. One would be the God, the actually the Acts of the Apostles, which is attributed to Saint Luke. The very First chapter, Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 11, St. Luke, who is the author of the Acts of the Apostles, gives us the many details of the ascension of our Lord into heaven. So St. Luke, who wrote the third gospel, and he also wrote the Acts of the Apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John the Acts, We've been reading and meditating the Acts of the Apostles the past 40 days. He recounts in great detail the ascension of Jesus. Then you have, given that this is in year B of the church liturgical cycle, you know we've got cycle A, B, and C. Cycle A is when we read Matthew. B, this year, we read Mark. C, we read St. Luke. A, B, and C, we're only, so you're going to be listening to the Gospel of St. Mark. The Gospel of St. Mark. So, um, what do we have? Jesus tells the, the apostles, the disciples, to go to Mount Olivet. And here we see Mount Olivet, and he's surrounded by his apostles and his disciples. This is the biblical reality, and it's the second glorious mystery. Now, before going up to heaven, Jesus gives them a message. He gives them a message, and this is the last message of Jesus before he ascends on high. He goes up to heaven, and he passes through the clouds, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father. As we pray in the creed, and from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. But he leaves the apostles, the disciples, as well as us with a 
very important message. He says, go into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. Go out into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. Another one of the gospels says, go out to the whole world and teach all that I taught you. In other words, don't teach your own doctrine, but teach the doctrine that I have taught you. With the Apostles, Jesus was present for three years. And then the Holy Spirit is going to come and enlighten their minds. That's what we're going to be celebrating next Sunday, is the coming of the Holy Spirit. I think that's a very interesting, a very interesting thing to meditate upon. Go out into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. In other words, Jesus wants everyone in the world, every person in the world, Jesus wants them to know about him. Yes. Jesus is the only Savior. He wants every, every person in the world Every person who's living this world to know about him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Salvation comes to us only through Jesus Christ. The name Jesus means God saves us. So this was, my friends, this was a missionary mandate. A missionary mandate. In trying to locate the words of Jesus in the modern church, there are two very important church events or ecclesial events in the past week, less than a week. And the first is Pope Francis issued just a few days ago an apostolic letter in which the Pope Mysterium Antiquum Ancient Ministry would be the translation into English which Pope Francis wrote a short apostolic letter on the whole reality of being a catechist. So I think there's a real connection between what Jesus says, go proclaim the gospel to every creature. And Pope Francis speaks about the importance of catechesis. He speaks about the importance of learning our faith. The importance of having catechists. And he speaks about the whole idea of catechesis from the top to the bottom. He says that the first catechist should be the primary teacher of the diocese. The primary teacher of the diocese is the bishop. The bishop has, as sacramental theology teaches us, the bishop has the fullness of the priesthood. He has the fullness of the priesthood, the three different levels, deacon, priest, bishop. I've got two, diaconate, presbytery. But the bishop has the fullness of the priesthood. So the bishop should be the first and primary teacher in his diocese to his flock that God has entrusted to him. Second 
he mentions that the priests are the collaborators of the bishops and we're called to be also we're called to be teachers and catechists then the pope mentions the fact that parents moms and dads parents moms and dads and many of you who are following me right now are mothers and fathers you mothers and fathers are called from the day that you get married you say i'm open to having children yesterday i did a marriage and one of the questions i asked are you open to having children to raise them as catholics and they said yes we are father that's part of your marital commitment your promise so parents are the first catechists of their children and that's why it's very important that we meet every day so that we can be undergoing this what's called this permanent formation constantly we have to be in the process of formation to get to know our faith better then the pope speaks about the catechist within the context of the mystical body of christ the catechist within the context of the church specifying the important role and he speaks about different ministries you have in the church you have what is called lector the person that reads in the mass acolyte someone who gives out communion he mentions the person of the porter the exorcist which were ministries in the past but the pope says that there is a new ministry that i'd like to institute and that is the ministry of a catechist so in the context of the church and the parish the catechist has a very important role catechist in teaching children and teaching teenagers and the ongoing catechesis of the adults yes the ongoing catechesis of the adults so the catechetical the catechetical, catechetical reality is from the youngest to the oldest we're all in the process of of learning you can never say that we know everything then the pope speaks about what's called the organic nature of catechesis in the sense that the kerygma is the first it's the first proclamation of the good news but once we have accepted christ we receive the sacraments there has to be an ongoing process in which we keep developing growing in our knowledge and love of our catholic faith so a an integral catechesis it has to be organic in the sense that there are four there are four different parts and i mention this because we're going through the catechism in catholic church we've arrived at number 357 we're taking one number at a time we're posting it for you but many of you probably have your own uh, text of the catechism in catholic church this this masterpiece of john paul ii which is probably his greatest writing is is divided into four different pillars you have the dogmatic part which explains the creed you have the sacramental part which is the channels of grace it comes to us with the seven sacraments then you have human actions which is called morality the explanation of the Ten Commandments. Then the last part of the Catechism, very pertinent to us in our holy hour, in our conversation on on a conversation of uh, perseverance, is the part on prayer. Is the part on prayer. So the Holy Father, uh, this past Monday. Uh, May 10th instituted he, he he published a new apostolic letter and it's called Mysterium Antiquum 
ancient ministry, which is that of a catechist. So from the very beginning of the church up to now, the importance of catechesis. Now it's interesting, my friends, that never have we lived in a world with so much information. Never. Never have we lived in a world with so much information. You have your internet, you have your phone. We can learn in a relatively short time almost anything we, we want to know by just a few touching some keys and then you've got it. But never have we lived in a world with so much confusion as today. There's so much information, but there's so much confusion. And that's one of the reasons why we have our conversation every morning. Is we're trying together to get to, to know the truth, to get to know what the Bible teaches us, to get to know what the Catechism teaches. That's why that document, the Catechesis of John Paul II, I'm relating it to what Jesus says in the Gospel today. Go out to all nations, proclaim the Gospel to every creature. Another Gospel says, go out and teach all nations what I taught you. You teach, you teach what I taught you. And I'll be with you always until the end of the world. And I'm just going to show you, talking about the, the world of confusion which we live in. I think all of you know that uh, religious sects are rampant in the world, especially in the United States. And two of the religious sects which are most prevalent, that I think probably all of you have met, would be that of the Mormons as well as the Jehovah Witnesses. Or, I repeat, the Mormons, the Latter-day Saints, they call themselves. The Mormons as well as the Jehovah Witnesses. Now this, you, this maybe you don't know. Is uh, Well, they go out Two and two, the Mormons dressed in a white shirt, their tie. They go out in bikes. The Jehovah Witnesses go out two and two with their watchtower and their Bible, trying to bring people to their religion. Now this you probably don't know, is that most Jehovah Witnesses used to be Catholics. And most Mormons used to be Catholics. What does that say to you? Most Jehovah Witnesses, they were Catholics before. Most Mormons, they were Catholics before. Now if you meet them, Inevitably, they'll say, well, I'm a Jehovah Witness, I'm a Mormon, because I finally discovered the true religion. They'll say that. In other words, they're saying that the Catholic religion is a false religion. It's a man-made religion. Con quite the contrary, the Jehovah Witness in Mormons is a man-made religion. founder would be Joseph Smith for the Mormons and for the Jehovah Witnesses and Russell for the Mormons. It's a man-made religion. But relate their topic to our topic. Why is it that these many millions of individuals have become Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons? You can give many reasons. You might say, well, the scandals in the church, well, partially. But I would assert that the primary reason 
why you have a loss of so many Catholics abandoning their Catholic faith to enter into these these false religions is precisely due to what we're talking about right now. Because over the past 50, 60 years, the catechesis as a whole, the catechesis as a whole, has been deplorable, has been very, very weak. Since Vatican II, catechesis has be become more subjective, more sentimental, more opinion-based than in transmitting the truth. In transmitting the truth. For that reason, it would be a good idea for all of you to read the apostolic letter of Pope Francis on, on catechesis. And also I mentioned that there's another event related to Jesus Jesus' word, go out into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature, is today is the World Day of Communication. Yes. Today is the World Day of Communication. The World Day of Communication. And I really see that there's a connection between the words that I've been commenting upon was Jesus gets up and he's communicating. He's giving his last message before he goes up to heaven. And he's saying, go out to all the world, to all creatures. Proclaim the gospel. Go out to all the world, teaching them all that I taught you then Jesus will say, baptize in them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus gives us, my friends, these most consoling words. These are among the most consoling words in the Bible. These words of Jesus were the last words that Jesus gave before he, he ascended on high into heaven. His last words were, And behold, I am with you always. Behold, I am with you always. Even until the end of the world. And after saying these words, Jesus, in the sight of the disciples and the apostles, Jesus ascends on high to heaven. Jesus goes up and up and up, and he passes through the clouds, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father, and two men in white appear the apostles and says to them, why are you looking up? Jesus, who you saw pass through the sky, will come in the same way. These two men dressed in white were angels, encouraging the disciples to focus on Jesus. That Jesus, even though he went into heaven, he'll be with us always, even until the very end of the world. So my friends, we're in right now the novena as, as we as we celebrate Jesus ascending into heaven on high to prepare a very special place for us. Jesus said, I'm going now to my father's house to prepare a place for for, for you so that where I am you also might be. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not tell you. So Jesus ascends on high to heaven, 
Why? To prepare a place for you and for me. So that should be a that should be a reason for great rejoicing on your part. Jesus ascends into heaven this very day in the church so that you who are part of his mystical body, I who am part of his mystical body, we will be with him one day in heaven. For that reason, my friends, we should rejoice exultantly and beg for the virtue of hope that one day, my friends, we're all going to go to heaven. So let's ask Mary, who goes to the cenacle with the apostles, praying for nine days and nine nights, for the coming of the Holy Spirit, that all of us would have a great desire in our lives to go to heaven. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.